Well, we can start. Um, on behalf of the Minyunyu Midrashek Committee, I'd like to welcome everyone to the first lecture for 2021. It's my pleasure to introduce you to our speaker tonight, Yaakov Katz. I met Yaakov many years ago at my sister and brother-in-law's home in Jerusalem, and I've been following his writings in the Jerusalem Post and on Twitter. A few months ago, I watched uh, Zoom lockdown learning that Yaakov participated in for the Zionist Federation of Australia which gave me the idea to contact Yaakov on behalf of the Midrashek Committee. Yaakov is the Jerusalem Post Editor-in-Chief. For close to a decade, he served as the paper's military reporter and defence analyst, and has also worked as the Israel correspondent for Jane's Defence Weekly. He was a lecturer at Harvard University, where he taught an advanced course in journalism. Prior to taking up the role as Editor-in-Chief, Yaakov served for two years as a Senior Policy Advisor to Israel's Minister of Economy and Minister of Diaspora Affairs. Yaakov is the author of two books, co-author of two books, Weapons Wizards, How Israel Became a High-Tech Military Power and Israel versus Iran, The Shadow War. Tonight, he's going to speak to us about his newest book, Shadow Strike, Inside Israel's Secret Mission to Eliminate Syrian Nuclear Power. Yaakov is a frequent speaker on issues relating to Israeli security and Middle East politics. Uh, after Yaakov speaks, there'll be some time for questions. Um, given the events of the past weeks, it's also a great opportunity to ask um, an international expert like Yaakov to, for his uh, take on the situation. If you'd like to ask a question, then you can use the chat function to write down that you'd like to ask a question. Then, um, Sarah Juka, who will be our moderator, and she will then call on you during the question time. Um, and also, if you have any sort of technical difficulties, you can also use the chat function and one of the hosts will try to assist you. Yaakov, it's an honour to have you speak to our community tonight. Well, thank you, Sarah. Uh, Shavua Tov, everyone. Good vach. Um, it's great to be with all of you after Shabbat. Uh, it's been a while since I've been to Zurich, but uh, hopefully we'll be able to visit soon. I actually got my first vaccine in uh, Bezrat Hashem, please God. This week, uh, I should be getting my second shot. To, to Israel's credit, we've done here a good job. I usually have plenty of criticism about this government when it comes to the way we've managed the coronavirus. But uh, at least with the rollout and the vaccination uh, of our country, there we, we, we can give credit where credit is owed and, and the government has actually done a very good job. I'll be happy to talk about that as well as all the other crazy things that are happening in the world. I'm sure you all saw after Shabbat uh, the news of, uh, of, of what's happening in the United States with Twitter deleting and suspending uh, Donald Trump's uh, uh, Twitter account and uh, the events of the past week, how this will all impact Israel, our new election that's coming up in just a couple of months. Uh, never a dull moment here in, uh, in Israel, in the Middle East, definitely. Uh, but, uh, but for now, uh, I'll follow with what uh, Sarah and the rest of the committee had had asked me, which is to speak about my new book, um, relatively new book from last year called Shadow Strike, which tells the story of how Israel back in 2007 destroyed Syria's uh, a secret nuclear reactor that Syria was building. And, and as a matter of fact, even though it's an event that took place in September of 2007, as, as, as I'll discuss it, uh, we'll see that it actually has a lot of uh, relevance to what's happening today, especially when we think about Iran and we think about its continued pursuit of nuclear capability. Just this past week, the Iranians announced that they were enriching uranium to higher levels, uranium being a key component of any nuclear weapon they would one day try to uh, obtain. And with the Joe Biden administration about to take office in just about 11 days in Washington and already seeing efforts on their part to uh, try to re-engage the Iranians and maybe bring them back into the nuclear deal that the previous administration, the Obama administration, had forged back in 2015. Definitely Iran, I would say, is going to be the large uh, clash or confrontation between Israel and the United States in the next few years if we're to think about the large issue that's on the table. But for now, before we jump there, I want to take you back in time to September 6, 2007. At the time, I was a military reporter for the Jerusalem Post, which basically my job meant covering the IDF, the Israel Defense Forces, operations, uh, terrorist attacks that sadly occasionally do happen still in this country. Uh, just today, there was an attack uh, that was actually, thankfully, a soldier was only lightly, lightly wounded. But um, that was my day job 
And on September 6, 2007, I was invited together with the rest of military reporters. Every newspaper, every radio station, every TV a channel and website has a at least one or two reporters whose beat is to cover the IDF in military affairs. And we were invited to come to a base near Rishon LeZion in the center of Israel, just south of Tel Aviv, called Sarifin. That base is prime real estate. So a few years ago, the IDF, in an attempt to try to get some more money, actually abandoned the base and sold off the land worth hundreds of millions so it could build high-rise apartments there. Uh, but then it was a big training base. And we were invited for a briefing with the uh, head, the chief IDF medical corps officer, who as a matter of fact, his name is Professor Chezi Levy. Today, he's actually the director general of Israel's Ministry of Health. So he's one of the people who's leading the fight, I would say, against the coronavirus and now uh, in, in very much in charge of the vaccination campaign that's going on throughout the country. But then he was an officer, he was a brigadier general, and we were invited for a briefing. Now, remember where we were in Israel back in September of 2007. This was just over a year after the Second Lebanon War. This is the war that was fought against Hezbollah in the summer of 2006. For 34 days, Israel and Hezbollah were at war. 4,300 rockets were fired into Israel, about 120 to 130 a day. The northern Israel became a ghost town. 122 soldiers were killed during that war, about 60-something civilians. Two Israeli reservists, Eldad Regev and Eud Goldwasser, their bodies, we didn't know at the time, were they alive, were they dead? But their bodies remained in Hezbollah captivity. And while the war, looking back today, six, 14 years in time, we can say, wow, that war actually brought quiet to Israel's northern border, an unprecedented quiet. It did allow for Hezbollah to build up an amazing capability, which they have today, hundreds, uh, over 150,000 rockets and missiles capable of striking anywhere in the state of Israel. But the war afterwards in Israel, there was a feeling that we didn't do as well as we could have. Hezbollah was still standing. We lost a lot of soldiers. The North had been pounded by missiles. We didn't have a response. Then there was no Iron Dome like there is today. And as a result, there was this process that was going through that the IDF did not do well, and therefore it had to rehabilitate itself. And there, were a new chief, there was a new chief of staff. Our current foreign minister, Gabi Ashkenazi, was appointed to the job. And he came into the role to rehabilitate and rebuild the military to prepare for the next war. That's where we were. That was the state of mind at the time. So, oh, someone asked me not to speak so fast. I will slow down, I apologize. So that's where we were at the time. And the process that Israel was going through involved inviting us every week or so to a briefing with another IDF officer. One day it was someone in the Air Force, one day it was someone in the ground forces, and that week on that day in September 6, 2007, it was with the chief IDF medical officer. And he was talking to us about lessons they learned from the war and uh, how they could be new innovation, new techniques. And that morning as we go to the briefing, then we had these small little machines, you might remember them, they were called beepers, right? You used to keep them on your belt. Uh, it's like a blast from the past. And our beepers go off as we're as this briefing is beginning. And we get a message on the beeper, I remember it like yesterday, that says there was a bombing the night before in Syria. And it was based on a Syrian news agency report that Israeli warplanes had infiltrated somewhere in the northeast of Syria, had dropped their bombs on an empty warehouse, and had been chased away by Syrian air defense missile systems. Now, this was strange, because today we think about an Israeli bombing of Syria and we say to ourselves, well, that happens all the time, right? Just this past week, there were reports of two or three Israeli bombings in Syria. Israel over the last few years has attacked Syria, Iranian targets in Syria, hundreds, if not maybe already a thousand at times in the last few years to prevent Iran from building up uh, military bases in Syria, similar to what it has with Hezbollah in Lebanon. But back in 2007, these kind of things never happened. And I remember we were sitting across from Chezi Levy, and one of us said to him, you know, General Levy, what was this? He said, nah, it was probably nothing, nothing important. I wouldn't, you know, uh, give it any thought. And we went on with our briefing. We had no clue what it was. Later did I discover he had no clue what it was. 
But as reports began to come out over the, over the months that followed, it became clear that this was something huge, monumental, and an incredible story about Israeli intelligence, Israeli political courage, and Israeli military might. And the story never really got told in a way, but from that moment in time, it fascinated me. It fascinated me because of the little information that came out that there was a nuclear reactor being built in Syria, that Israel had bombed it, that no one knew about it, the generals in the IDF didn't even know about it. How did this happen? And as I began to look into it a few years ago, I discovered that it's actually a story very much like the raid on Entebbe when Israeli commandos from Sayeret Matkal flew to Entebbe, Uganda to rescue those Air France hostages in 1976. It was a story the likes of the bombing of the Osirak reactor that Saddam Hussein was building in Iraq back in 1981, or even the way the Six Day War opened back in 1967 when the Israeli Air Force in one day, in less than a day, was able to take out the entire Egyptian and Syrian air forces. But to tell you the story, I want to take you back a little more in time to the spring of 2007. At the time, there was a feeling in Israel, in the military intelligence circles, that something nuclear was happening in Syria, but no one could put their finger on it. Now remember, the country is still focused on rebuilding itself after this war in Lebanon. We don't know if another war will erupt. We have the Iranian nuclear threat. No one's thinking about Syria. This is pre-so-called Arab Spring. This is pre-2011, when the civil war broke out across the region in Egypt, in Tunisia, in Libya, and then, of course, also in Syria. But there were signs that something was going on. Now, Israel knew that Syria had a nuclear program. It had a nuclear reactor, a research reactor. It had purchased from the Chinese back in the 1990s. But it had a staff of about 12, 13 people, nothing serious, nothing that could ever create or build a nuclear weapon. It's just purely for research and medical purposes. But they felt that something strange was happening, but they couldn't put their finger on it. I later saw documents that were analyzing this inside military intelligence, and one of them even had a picture of Assad at the top, an arrow going down to a Pakistani flag, and another arrow going down to a North Korean flag, and then a big question mark in the middle. And the question was, is there something nuclear going on? And if so, is it with Pakistan? Is it with North Korea? They couldn't figure out what was happening. But they received word that Syria's top nuclear scientist, the head of the Syrian Atomic Energy Commission, now remember, very small, so it sounds big, but a very small commission. This was in, His name was Ibrahim Otman, was flying to Vienna. And the head of military intelligence in Israel went to the head of the Mossad, a man by the name of Mayor Dagan, you may have heard of him, he passed away a few years ago, and asked Dagan, the head of the Mossad, that's our you know, equivalent of our CIA, our, our intelligence agency that works overseas, to send a couple of agents, fly, he, Ibrahim Otman was going to a country not far from you in Austria, he was going to Vienna, and he was going to be attending meetings at the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, right, the United Nations nuclear watchdog, which is based in Vienna. And the general asked Dagan if he could send a couple of agents to see what Otman was doing, maybe get into his hotel room, peek inside his briefcase, download something from his computer. And uh, Dagan was a bit hesitant because he said, this is not interesting to us. There's nothing to worry about Syria. We have our hands full with Iran and, and Hezbollah, Hamas, Islamic Jihad, uh, Al-Qaeda at the time. Right? We, we don't need to be worrying about Bashar al-Assad and Syria. But in the end, he gave in. Now, this wasn't the first time, by the way, that Mossad agents had followed uh, Ibrahim Otman around the world. A, few, a couple of times, they had done the same thing, and they always came back empty-handed. But they decided to send a couple of Mossad agents, and they flew to Vienna. And uh, actually, that day, they presented the operation to our prime minister at the time, Ehud Olmert. And they even on his, in his office in Jerusalem, they posted a map of Vienna and the streets. And they put like little kind of circles where the, where the cars would come from, where the getaway car would be, where the agents would set up. But it was an operation that wasn't something extremely complicated. As a matter of fact, that same day in another country in Europe, there was another Mossad operation that was taking place, which was deemed to be much more important, much more strategic. And this was kind of like, we'll do this 
you know, on the way type of thing. So the agents go there and uh, they go into, they manage to go into his hotel room. And Otman, for the first time, had made a, a critical strategic mistake, unlike in past times when uh, Israel had tried to track track him and, and see what he was up to, he left his laptop computer in his hotel room. And they attached a flash drive, and they downloaded the contents of everything that was on his computer. Now, to give you again, just, just illustrates how unimportant this was perceived by Israel. They, uh, when the agents returned to Israel, they brought the flash drive, the Mossad agents brought the flash drive, and they gave it to the uh, soldiers in the IDF. And they didn't even uh, and de-encrypt it. They didn't even uh, look to see what was on it. For two weeks, this flash drive sat on a shelf inside an IDF headquarters. And then after two weeks, people are like, one second, whatever happened to that stuff we got on that raid that we did in Vienna? And they said, oh, wait, wait, we have the flash drive. So they start to look through the flash drive, and they're floored, floored. They're shocked. On this flash drive, they discover pictures, photos of a nuclear reactor under construction in northeastern Syria. They have the core of the reactor, the fuel rods of the reactor, the, the, the structure, the actual building of the reactor. But the kicker was this photo where you saw Ibrahim Otman, the head of the Nuclear uh, Atomic Energy Commission of Syria, posing for a photo in front of the building together with a guy, an Asian man. And he was wearing this blue kind of Adidas track suit, you know, like a running you know, suit that people wear. And they were looking at this guy and like, what is this Asian guy doing in Syria? So they look through their databases to see who this guy is. And they discover that this man who's standing from posing for this photo with Ibrahim Otman, his name is actually Chon Chibu. And he is the director of the Yongbyon nuclear complex in North Korea. So not only was Bashar al-Assad building a nuclear reactor in Syria, he was doing so together with, the, with, with, with a country that is possibly the greatest threat to the United States and to parts of, uh, of Asia and the Far East, right, North Korea. So right away, this story became something completely different. And, and it just goes to show how Israel had so little expectation that anything would come of it, that it did not believe that it would discover anything, but ultimately discover something that is about to become possibly one of the greatest existential threats to the state of Israel. Remember, in Iraq, Iraq's far away when they were building a nuclear reactor back in 1981, and Israel destroyed it. Iran is also potentially one day an existential threat with the nuclear reactor that they were building. That's also still far away. Syria is literally our backyard. It's just over the border. This isn't 2,000 kilometers away. This is maybe 500, 600 kilometers away. And, and this reactor is being built, and Israel did not know anything about it. So not only is this a massive intelligence failure of sorts, but it's also a question of what do we do? Because the reactor is on its way to becoming uh, active and to becoming uh, hot, as they would say. And the decision was taken very early on that to be able to destroy it, if they were going to use military action, they would have to do so in the coming months. Because the moment that this nuclear reactor becomes active, the reactor was sitting very close to the Euphrates River, which is a massive river that runs from Syria across Iraq all the way through into Asia. If they were to uh, bomb it after it had already become active or hot in that term, it could spread radioactive material into the Euphrates River and is, it would be contaminated for generations. Israel would be potentially responsible for horrific things that could happen to people who live along the Euphrates River in Syria as well as in Iraq. And therefore, Israel's the clock was ticking and it was ticking fast. Now, what makes this story interesting, and I don't want to tell the whole book from you know A to Z because that'll take forever. But it shows us really, you know, we, we hear so often about the Israeli-US alliance in particular, right? And how Israel and America have this strategic alliance, how they work together. But very rarely do we get to see exactly what that means, right? How does it work from behind the scenes? And I felt that here what what was so unique about the story was that unlike in 1981 when Israel destroyed 
Iraq's reactor, then Menachem Begin was the prime minister. Menachem Begin did not tell anyone in the United States that this is what Israel was doing. He did not share that information with anybody, and Israel did it secretly, and it ultimately was condemned, if you recall, by the United States. Ronald Reagan, who was then the president, suspended the delivery of fighter jets to Israel and actually led a UN Security Council resolution against Israel pass at the United Nations, right? Did not veto it because they were so upset with Israel for taking that unilateral action against Iraq at the time. But this time, Ehud Olmert, who was the prime minister, and we could talk a bit about him later, obviously a very complicated character. You, you all remember that he eventually went to Israel, went to a jail, right? Uh, brought shame to the state of Israel, was, was charged and convicted in court and sat in jail for about two plus years. But here he decided to go to uh, the United States and to share this information with George W. Bush. By the way, when they, when they encrypted, just to give you a sense of this complex reality that we live in, when, when the Mossad and the IDF intelligence finally uh, went through and analyzed these photos, Dagan calls up Olmert, the head of the Mossad, calls the prime minister, and says, I need to meet with you urgently. Now, Olmert was heading down south because there were rockets being fired from Gaza into Israel. So he said, I can only meet with you later in the day. I got to go down south first. So he goes down south because Hamas is a big threat. Then he comes back to his office in Jerusalem. And Dagan, together with two of his top officers, comes to the prime minister's office and puts down the photos and shows them to the prime minister and starts explaining to him what they are. And at that moment, Olmert recognizes right away that this, this changes everything. Right? This, this is a game changer. Forget about Gaza. Forget about anything else. This is a potential. If, if Assad gets a nuclear weapon, that could change everything for Israel. And as he's sitting there, it was about 6, 6.30 at night. There's a knock on the door of his office. And Olmert is not thinking about anything. He says, get away. I can't talk to you right now. And the knocking persists. And in walks his spokesperson. And his spokesperson says, Mr. Prime Minister, I have, I have an urgent question. So the Prime Minister says, what? He says, there's, you know, in Israel, we have our nightly newscast is every night at 8 p.m. So he says, it's an hour and a half from now. He says one of the big TV news channels is going to be running a story of another criminal investigation that's being opened against you, right? So as Olmert is looking at this intelligence, right, that is changes everything for the state of Israel, he gets this, he gets, he, there's going to be a, a newscast that's about to talk about another criminal investigation against him. I mean, it, it's, it's just, you think about what these people have to deal with. I mean, this is complicated stuff. But anyhow, it, 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 it's, the, the story has with it, it has this amazing intelligence. It has the, uh, the complication and the complex character of Ehud Olmert. It has, and it, and it also has this, if you remember, there was a movie back in 1997, I don't know if you recall, called Wag the Dog. I don't know, what, I mean, that's what it was called in English, but it, 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 it had Robert De Niro and Dustin Hoffman. And it was about uh, a president who got, I think he, he had some scandal, right? Maybe it was a sex scandal. I can't remember at the time right now, but he had some scandal. And uh, to kind of divert attention, distract the public, they made up a fake war, right? With Albania or something like that. Uh, Israel did a, a, made its own wag the dog. Because now imagine, remember where I told you we are. We're just a year after the Second Lebanon War, a bad war. Now we're, we're, we're planning an attack against Syria. And we might be going to a war with Syria. This is clearly Assad's prized possession. We're about to maybe destroy it. Now, Syria, this is pre-Civil War Syria. Syria has more tanks than us. They have an air force, not as sophisticated as ours, but still a possible threat. They have more artillery cannons than we do. They have ballistic missiles that are capable of reaching anywhere in Israel. And this is before 2013, Remember when the Russians and the Americans got them to disarm from their chemical weapons? They had thousands of tons of chemical weapons. Right? We still have gas masks at the time. Now, this is a formidable opponent. This isn't Hezbollah. We didn't do so well against Hezbollah. Now we might be going to a war with Syria. How do you get the military ready for a war when you can't tell them why they're getting ready for a war with Syria? Because very early on, they made a decision they discover that not many people in Syria know about this nuclear reactor, that Assad was keeping it very quiet. So they figured that there's potential that if they do bomb it, Assad, because no one really knows about it, would prefer to keep it quiet. But it was a gamble. Maybe he would attack. And therefore, you have to find some way to prepare for a war without telling anyone why you're preparing for a war. 
that's complicated too. So it was almost like it's Israel's own wag the dog moment. So you have this amazing intelligence, this subterfuge that you have to do to be able to prepare for a war, but really this unprecedented look into the way the U.S.-Israel alliance works. And I want to talk for a moment about that. You know, we hear all the time about choose your adjective, how this bond is unbreakable, unshakable, impenetrable. But rarely have I felt throughout 20-something years now in journalism is that how it really works and how it works from behind the scenes. We know that Israel gets $3.8 billion in aid and you know the Iron Dome and the Aero Missile and, and David Slings. But we don't get to know really what goes on behind closed doors. And 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 and, and I was privileged and during the during during the work on this book was really to get access to almost everyone except for the president himself. Uh, I couldn't George W. Bush did not want to talk to me. I tried many different ways to get to him. But I was able to make, meet with Vice President Dick Cheney a couple of times and to speak to him a number of times, as well as really everyone else. And, and what happened was when Israel came to the White House and brought this intelligence back in April of 2007, remember Israel bombed in September. So that's five months, five months during which America made its own preparations and made its own considerations. And Ehud, and George W. Bush, who was, the pre, who was the president at the time, seriously considered his options and thought about attacking. Omer called up Bush and said to him, you need to attack. Now for Omer, the reason was, was, was twofold. The first was, if America attacks, the chance that Syria would retaliate against Israel significantly drops to some extent, right? Because it wasn't necessary, it wasn't Israel that did the attack. On the other hand, it was also the more important issue that he was thinking about was Iran. Iran was always in the back of his mind. If Israel attacked Syria, Omer knew, Iranians would say, okay, that's expected. But if the United States attacks Syria, the Iranians, it would shake them. They would realize that this is not, the, uh, this is not what they had expected. And if America was willing to attack Syria, it could also potentially one day attack uh, Iran. And therefore, the Iranians might reconsider their own strategy and their own pursuit of a nuclear capability. But I want to fast forward to uh, September 6th. And that's the day that Israel attacks. And on, just after midnight, Israel sends a few fighter jets, F-16s. They fly into, they fly from the Mediterranean. They go up north. They cut across the border near Turkey and Syria, and they fly in, and then they dip into Syria, they bomb the reactor. Just to give you a sense, uh, about a year ago, my wife and I, pr before COVID, when we could go to events, my wife and I were invited to an event at the U.S. Ambassador to Israel, David Friedman's uh, residence in Herzliya, and uh, we're, uh, we're, we're standing at the food, at the, the buffet, getting some food, and we meet some U.S. Air Force pilots uh, who fly F-35s, so those advanced fighter jets that uh, Israel also has, and we've actually been using them for a while now. They're operational, and they were had come here to do some joint exercises with Israel, and I was talking to them. I told them my name, and they said, oh, we actually read your book uh, it just after it had come out, and uh, they said, you know, we've studied that operation. Now, even though the, the flight and even though it was close to Israel, it wasn't far, so it wasn't like, you know, extremely complicated. And we know that Israel nowadays attacks in Syria uh, quite often. But to give you a sense of just the, the, the operational uh, sophistication, Ehud Barak, the former prime minister, was at the time the defense minister. And he lived at a, at a high rise apartment building overlooking the Ayalon freeway. That's that highway that cuts through the middle of Tel Aviv. And after the morning of the attack, he goes, he spends a few hours in the bunker to see what would happen. And then when things were quiet, he goes home and he goes out to his mirpesa, to his balcony, drinking an, an espresso. And he looks down, he lives on the 23rd, I think, or 24th floor. And he realizes that the pilots had flown the whole way to Syria at a lower altitude than the, the, the balcony that he was standing on. So while it wasn't far from us, they flew so low to avoid radar detection, that, that 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 was just incredible. And these US Air Force pilots who I met just last year were explaining to me that that was like incredible to them. How did they do that? How were they able to fly so low through territory they didn't necessarily know? But you know, thankfully we have an amazing, amazing uh, Air Force. So Israel attacks Syria and uh, it, uh, Olmert had found out 
previously that George W. Bush would be in uh, Sarah's uh, former country, uh, Australia at the time, and would be uh, uh, attending a meeting of APEC, which was the Asian Pacific Economic Cooperation. Now, George W. Bush already in July had told Olmert that he had decided not to attack, right? He wanted to go on a diplomatic uh, option that had been created in the White House, which was basically going to be to uh, take the issue to the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, then to the Security Council in New York, impose sanctions, threaten with military action, and then if Assad did not dismantle the reactor, then to reserve the right to destroy it. Israel said right away, this is unacceptable. On that phone call, it took place on a Friday between Bush and Olmert. Olmert said right away, this is unacceptable. And uh, I remember I spoke with uh, two other, two members of George Bush's staff who were on the call with the president and the prime minister. And they were sure that Olmert with his chutzpah to say to the president of the United States, this is unacceptable, I won't accept this, that Bush would be upset. Actually, when Bush put down the phone receiver, he said, you know what, I like this guy. He's got, you know, he's got guts. And, 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 and that kind of talks to maybe a bit about Bush and, and his, you know, he's a Texan and, and his character itself. But uh, Omer decided then that if America was going to attack it, Israel eventually wouldn't. That's how we found ourselves in September. So Israel bombs the reactor, waits a few hours, the strike goes okay, and waits to see what Assad will do. And they quickly learned that Assad had basically been woken up in the middle of the night, was told what had happened, and pretty much went back to sleep. There was a war was not breaking out that night. So Ulmer decided that it was time to get Bush on the phone and to update him what was happening. He was, again, as I mentioned, he was in Australia. So uh, his office calls the White House. The White House calls George Bush in Australia until they get him on the phone. It's already early in the morning here in Israel, which is the middle of the day in, in Australia. And... Uh, Ulmer gets on the phone, I want to read to you the transcript from their conversation. He said, Mr. President, how are you? Ulmer asked. So Bush says, fine. How are you enjoying Australia? Ulmer continued, it's a great country, Sydney, it's very nice, great weather. So Bush says yes, and then Ulmer could already tell that he's getting a little agitated, like the president's thinking, why is the Israeli prime minister calling me in Australia to talk about the weather? Uh, so Olmert says to him, by the way, Mr. President, Olmert was, was careful because, again, as I mentioned, Israel took this gamble that if it stays quiet, it doesn't say anything, that maybe Assad will let the whole thing slide and there won't be retaliation. So Omer wanted to be careful, even though he was on the call with the president. So he says, Mr. President, do you remember there was something in the North that we didn't like? And the president says, yes. So Omer says, well, I just wanted to let you know that it does not exist anymore. So Bush was also himself careful on the call. He said, oh, that's very interesting. Do you expect, he asked, a response or have a feeling about a response? Omer said, no. For the time being, it seems that all indications are that there will be no response. And Omer was sure that that would be the end of their conversation. But then Bush said something that took him by surprise. And Bush said, okay, but I want you to know that if there will be a response, you can count on all of America being behind you. And I mention this because, yes, it's just one conversation. It's one conversation of countless that takes place between presidents and Israeli prime ministers, right? We can imagine for a moment what some of those conversations between Donald Trump and Benjamin Netanyahu look like. But, uh, but you look at what's said. You look at what Bush tells Olmert. You look at how they speak to one another. When a president says something like this after an Israeli prime minister just took a huge gamble, did something that could potentially take his country, not to the brink of war, to an actual war, uh, you, 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 you are giving him a sense of confidence that he has done something right, that it, it is, it's incredible. And it really shows and it showcases, I think, what this relationship and what makes it unique and, and, and why it's important, the, the Israel-US uh, alliance. But I think there's also lessons here in this story that are important for us to look at today. The first is we learn about statesmanship, right? Olmert, as I mentioned, he was a complicated character. He brought shame to Israel. He went to jail for receiving a bribe. He's remembered as the prime minister who failed in the war of 2006. But in this story, and I can't judge him overall, but I can judge him in this one story. What we saw here was a completely different Olmert. He was facing calls to resign because of the outcome of the war in Lebanon. 
He was facing police investigations. He had not yet been indicted, but he was under investigation. He, he, and he had a U.S. president who said to him, Ehud, I got your back, man. I'll take care of it. You don't have to attack. I'll, I'm taking it to the U.N. I'm taking it to the IAEA. He had all the reasons in the world to follow what the Americans were saying, but he said no. He stood up. He understood his place in history, like Menachem Begin in 1981. He understood that he couldn't deposit the fate of the Jewish state in anyone. He couldn't allow Syria to obtain nuclear weapons. And would other politicians act the same way? I don't know. And that's a good question, but it's a question we should always be asking ourselves. The other thing that's very important is that when, while this book takes place in 2007, which seems like a long time ago, it has amazing relevance today. Israel continues to grapple with the nuclear Iran. It continues to think about what is the best option. How will it stop the Iranian pursuit of nuclear capability, which if they were to one day get their hands on a nuclear weapon would pose an existential threat to the continued existence of the Jewish state of Israel here in this land. And, and, and what will it do? And is, does a military option still exist? And how can it be used? And I think what we have here is a potential blueprint for what can be done one day and how it can be used and how Israel could potentially one day do what it did in Iraq and in Syria against the Iranians. But there's also North Korea. And you learn a lesson here in humility. North Korea, in the end of 2006, tested its first nuclear device, a nuclear bomb. George W. Bush was the president. He gave a speech. It was October of 2006. He gave a speech in the White House. And he said, if we catch them, this is terrible. It's unacceptable. We won't let this continue. But he said, if we catch them proliferating nuclear technology, transferring nuclear technology to other places, then they will pay a price. Well, half a year later, Israel comes to the White House and shows intelligence of how North Korea is not just proliferating nuclear technology to anyone, they're building a nuclear reactor for one of the greatest rogue states in the world, Syria. But America did nothing. North Korea paid no price. As a matter of fact, George Bush, under pressure from his Secretary of State at the time, Condoleezza Rice in 2008, decided to remove North Korea from the list of state sponsors of terrorism that the State Department in the United States keeps. They were trying to, if you remember, there was something called the Six Party Talks at the time. They were trying to engage and negotiate with North Korea. Well, that didn't work. When Trump, Donald Trump came back to office, came into office in 2017, he returned North Korea to that list. But even his efforts to engage with, with Kim Jong-un, they, they all failed, right? The, 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 the North Korea still today has a larger arsenal and poses and continues to pose a grave threat to the United States as well as to Japan, South Korea, and elsewhere throughout the world. Now, could they have been stopped back then? I don't know. But it goes to show what happens when you let a country get away with something of this scale. They don't learn. They learned a bad lesson back then. And it was a lesson that went to show that they can do something that, that obviously, without paying a price, and they'll continue. So I think that these are all important issues that have wide-ranging impact for Israel, the Middle East, and beyond. But the book is not, I don't want it to be just about who was right and who was wrong. The U.S. had legitimate concerns of why a strike against Syria would not be a good idea for them. And Israel felt an urgency that the U.S. simply didn't. I mean, remember, geographically, we're here, they're there, right? So you're always going to have that difference. But I think in this book, and with this I'll end, we have an example of what makes Israel unique, right? We're a very complicated country. You all know that. We're a complicated people. We can be difficult. But we're also threatened like no one else. But we do take the role, which is of the preservation of the Jewish people very seriously. And actually ended the book with a quote from Hillel Hazakain, from the Hillel the Elder, from Pirkei Avot, right, from the Ethics of Our Fathers. What he said 2,000 years ago, and that I think is the ultimate lesson. If I am not for myself, who will be for me? That is what Israel showed in this story. That's what Ehud Olmert showed, but that's what Israel showed in the story of when it decided to take action against Syria's nuclear reactor. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions on this, on anything else. Shoot. Thank you very much.
I think we have not yet received any specific requests for questions, but please um, either let me unmute yourself or um, ask your questions. I see that Dudi seems to have a question already. So Dudi, off you go, please. Hi, and thank you very much. It was um, very, very interesting. Um, so basically what I think it's very um, uh, surprising is that it seems that it's kind of a bit of a coincidence uh, how everything happens and maybe I would be wondering if you have any um, if you can say something about any consequences this uh, episode has for Israeli intelligence maybe in the future I don't know either to pay more attention or to uh, kind of be able to focus more on things like that yeah, no, it's a great question. It's an important question, right? Israel, like like what like we mentioned, and you again reiterated, was caught off guard, did not know that this was happening literally in its backyard, right? This isn't some country thousands of miles away. This is just over the border. We share a massive border with Syria and Syria. Remember this before the civil war in Syria and its military pretty much disintegrated, Syria was the last conventional military that Israel still potentially had to consider fighting a war with. With Egypt, we had peace. With Jordan, we had peace. Uh, Hamas was not a conventional military. Hezbollah is not a conventional military. We don't share a border with Iraq or Iran, but with Syria, we do. And, and they still, at that time, had a very large military. And that was the country that we were always thinking about, like if there ever was gonna be a big battle, but we missed this. And as a matter of fact, there were there was an investigation. It was led uh, even by the Knesset's Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee. It's uh, in Hebrew, Vadat Chutzu Bitachon of the Knesset, uh, of Israel's parliament. And they looked into uh, what had maybe gone wrong here in the intelligence. And I think it was a lesson in humility. It was a lesson that uh, we don't always know what's happening, right? And intelligence is always going to be a very complicated uh, game of sorts, right? You only know what you know. Uh, but you have to keep your eyes open and you have to be aware. And I think that with Iran, if we apply that lesson to what's happening in Iran, the, the, the concern that I've heard over the years, for example, from Israeli intelligence officers is that, excuse me, you know, we know about, for example, Natanz, which is their main uh, enrichment facility for uranium. That's where there was uh, that explosion over the summer and that facility above ground. But the main facility is actually low ground in a bunker. We know about Comb, which is another enrichment facility. We know about some of their other, but there's always been this concern in Israel. What about what we don't know? Maybe there's something that we don't necessarily know. And I think Israel has very good intelligence about Iran, but there's always the possibility that they're doing something that we don't know about. And 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 I think that that's what makes this such a, such a huge challenge. And, uh, and, and it was a lesson in humility. We can hope it's been applied. I think today we don't have to worry necessarily about Syria. They have major problems. The problem with Syria today is the uh, is the Iranian entrenchment, right? Iran is trying to build up a base of operations in Syria, has to some extent succeeded. Uh, they came initially to the rescue of Bashar Assad as he was fighting ISIS uh, and rebels in Syria, but uh, together with the Russians and Putin and together with, uh, with Iran, but the Iranians aren't leaving. And Israel, of course, does not want them there. They've built up a capability, and Israel periodically tries to take out their infrastructure. Uh, thankfully, that has yet to escalate into a larger conflict, but that potential also exists, right? And, and, and right now, as a matter of fact, there's a high level of alert here in Israel because January, just a couple of days ago, was the one-year anniversary of the American assassination of Qasem Soleimani. That was the Iranian uh, commander of the Quds Force who was killed in, a, in an American drone strike in Iraq back uh, in January of 2020. But just a few weeks ago, you'll all recall, was the... Uh, amazing assassination of Mohsen Farahzideh, the uh, uh, Iranian top nuclear scientist attributed to Israel. The Iranians have a score that they want to settle, and they want to settle it with us. And there's a number of ways for them potentially to do that. One way is to attack us along a border. Another way is to do something overseas. But Israel all the time has to be on high alert as a result. Thank you. Maybe when uh, going back to your um, explanations on the strategic alliance between US and Israel, do you want to maybe um, 
tell us a little bit how you see it nowadays. Like how was it in the past administration, this um, strategic alliance and what are your hopes or um, yeah, ideas for the future with the new president coming in? Look, I think that you know, with with the Trump administration, Israel has as as crazy as Trump uh, might be, uh, and we've seen some some really nutty stuff in the last uh, few days. But um, when it comes to Israel, he has been a great friend, right? And and I think that's important to mention. Uh, uh, Israel has has reaped some strategic benefits working together with this administration. We've seen the recognition of Jerusalem, the moving of the uh, embassy to Jerusalem, the recognition of Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights, the uh, the pullout withdrawal from the Iranian nuclear deal, the uh, normalization deals, the Abraham Accords with the UAE. I was in I I traveled to Dubai uh, uh, just uh, less than a month ago for the first time. Um, I mean, th these are incredible things, right? So we 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 can actually, I think it's important to acknowledge that alongside some of these really bad things that that, that seem to be happening in the United States right now. But uh, during this period, Israeli and US military relations have really reached new levels, uh, uh, pretty incredible. Even during the Obama years, it's important to mention that while there was a lot of tension on a political diplomatic relationship between President Obama and Prime Minister Netanyahu, on a military to military level, there was great great, great cooperation, and especially intelligence sharing. And you'll remember that shortly before Obama ended his term in office in, uh, in January of 2017, he uh, signed a new MOU with Israel, a uh, memorandum of understanding, a deal that basically upped and increased the military aid to Israel from $3.3 billion annually to $3.8 billion annually. That's, that's a lot of money to be giving Israel every year. So, uh, so I, it th things are still very good in that place. And, um, you know, I think that when, when we look, by the way, I've heard this from a number of officers in Israel, especially in the Mossad, is that after the Lebanon war, right? So it was, uh, like I said, to you, like I said earlier, it was, a, it was a process of rehabilitation for Israel, but it also, we looked bad in the eyes of the world. The world thought of Israel as this mighty military, as this amazing, incredible, sophisticated, high tech army. And we couldn't destroy Hezbollah. What had happened to us? And there was a there was a loss of respect on between from militaries, from intelligence agencies. And then comes this discovery of a nuclear reactor in Syria. The world knew nothing about. America didn't know. No one knew. And we discovered it. And that created a newfound respect among America for within America for Israel. And, and that led to additional operations with the CIA and the Mossad and other things. And I think that when you look back at the, at the relationship, you can actually even find that the origins of this close relationship that we have now, some of that started actually, it, it kind of became, it reinvigorated itself it, it, in, in this story of the Syrian nuclear reactor. Thank you. We have another question from Cedric. I will try to unmute you, Cedric, so you can ask the question yourself, please. Good. Thank you very much. Good to see you. Um, Hi, Cedric. Question. Hi. <laughs> uh, quick question just about like the, the fourth election that is coming up now, and a little bit of like, maybe you can share a little bit of the sentiment that is going on in Israel. I mean, like from the outside, I can only see what's going on Times of Israel and Jerusalem Post and you name it, but um, maybe you can tell a little bit like what, what is the word on the street and um, how are people perceiving now Bibi in this twifolder between, you know, like the vaccine and all of these deals with the Arab country, countries and on the other side, um, yeah, like the, the court cases that he has coming up. Well, I mean, it's a good question. P people are fed up, obviously, with elections. Uh, no one, <laughs> no one is happy about the fact that we're going to a fourth election. Uh, I don't think that BB himself is happy with this situation, and he's not doing too well. When you look at the polling numbers, he does not currently have a path to form a government. What he does potentially have is the ability to deny anyone else the ability to form a government, which leads me to predict today on January 9th, so don't hold me to it, that the fourth election is only the gateway to a fifth election uh, if, if nothing really changes, which, which is just terrible. It's terrible for Israel. This whole situation has been terrible because it has us stuck inside this just 
ongoing onslaught of mudslinging and, and, and dirty campaigning and, and doesn't allow the country to, to come together like, like we're supposed to, or we would, we would hope that we could do. Um, and so, so that, you know, that, that's just the, the overall, I would say just the bad environment in, in general, though, his campaign is definitely, like you mentioned, very much focused on vaccines, right? This is, this is what he's running on tonight. He got his second dose, right? Three weeks ago, Saturday, he was the first Israeli to be vaccinated. Um, I mean, just, you know, in contrast, I, I have to mention in the UK, the first person to be vaccinated was a 90 something year old grandmother in the United States. The first person to be vaccinated was a nurse in a hospital here in Israel. The first person to be vaccinated was the prime minister. You know, everything is, of course, political. But uh, today he got his second vaccine every day he talks about the vaccines every week he goes and visits vaccination centers uh this is this is the t this is his campaign and his campaign is basically uh his hope is that by we already have about 1.5 i think 1.7 million people sorry who have already been vaccinated uh that's incredible right we're almost at 20 percent of the country i mean it, it, no one else in the world is 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 at this stage right now uh and Think, you know, it has a lot to do. It's not BB that's managed to vaccinate all of us. We, it's our medical system, which is based on, if you're familiar with the Israeli health system, we have what are called the Kupot Cholim. They're basically the health funds. And the health funds are in the community, right? They're all over the place. So, so because we, we have this socialist so-called health system, uh, it, it to now proves itself as, as being everywhere. And being so accessible and able to roll out and distribute, right? In America, for example, they have the number of vaccines. They just don't know how to get them out to the public, right? That, that's a huge, that's a huge problem. Here we're able to do that very effectively. Um, but his hope is to, by the end of February, have about half the country vaccinated. By the end of March, when we go to an election to have pretty much everyone vaccinated over the age of 16, which is what's allowed right now. Uh, based on Pfizer and Moderna. Uh, there's going to be, there's talk of maybe lowering the age to 12, but basically, I mean, you'll imagine we'll have 60, 70% of the country vaccinated. Th that could be the end of the coronavirus for Israel, which means the economy will open up, people will go back to work, culture, arts, theater, et cetera, travel. He's hoping that's what will get him votes. And, and it might work, by the way, it might work. Uh, his criminal investigation is, investigation, sorry, his criminal trial is uh, will have begun by then it already has begun but he's managed to turn that into something of a non-issue I, I think the real question will come down to and this is this is good for him you see ultimately the question of do i want bb or do i not want bb is good for bb right because it it focuses the entire election on him and that's where he'll do well right if we start to talk about policy that's where he would do not well right but no one gets to talk about policy because it's always about him. And, and, and that distracts everyone and that distracts the media. We, we put the attention and the focus on the same thing, but that plays into his hands to an extent. Uh, so we'll see what, what comes of these elections. For now though, like I said, the polling numbers are not looking very favorable for him. He might be the largest party, but he has no pathway to a coalition and we're a coalition government here. We have two additional questions, more related actually to what you spoke beforehand. Um, Marcel, do you want to ask your question by yourself? Okay, thank you. Um, I tried the name, um, spell out, uh, pronounced correctly. Yeah, Marcel, <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, what you explain is fascinating and thank you very much for the way it works without working. Um, before I ask the question, there's just a remark about the uh, Secret Service, when you think back to the Yom Kippur War, where the intelligence was there, but the political echelon did, didn't want or did. But th that's, you can talk about it later. What maybe you have more details about this incredible uh, killing of Fahizadji that even the Iran uh, th Iranian people or the, the I don't know the government think it was from a satellite uh, tele, you know mm -hmm. man by, by a incredible how did they do that do you have any idea <laughs> I, 
I, honestly, I, I, I can't, I don't know necessarily more than has come out in the reports. Um, I know that, you know, there's been all these claims of that it was remote control, that it was some satellite. I would, I would look at that more of Iran putting out a version to be able to excuse how it failed, right? Because this was a huge failure for Iran, that its top nuclear scientist was gunned down in the middle of the day on a road just outside of Tehran. Uh, that sounds like a cool story. Uh, that, that's probably not what happened. But what you can think and, and just understand from an operation of this kind is he is a protected man. He has security that travels with him. You have to know where he's going. You have to follow him and track him. You have to have units that are in place. You have to have someone who's followed him for a period of time to know how he drives because he doesn't go on a regular road like you or I would go. He, 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 he tries to avoid being followed. Uh, this, this entailed a and required significant resources and infrastructure. It's not something that you just plan on a Monday and carry out on a Friday, right? This is something that you put into works in advance and you have to find him and you have to track him, and you have to follow him and you have to have the people on the ground who can do all of that. This is extremely complicated. So who it was that ultimately pulled the trigger, whether it was some satellite or some or an assassin, I would probably assume these were gunmen who were on the side of the road. You know, we're, again, there's other questions we could ask. Were these Israelis? Were they, was it a proxy? Uh, does, is it Israel that actually carries this out or does it use, some other organization, maybe local Iranian dissidents who, who work on its behalf. I mean, Israel has proven over the last couple of years an amazing penetration of Iran, right? You remember all last summer, the series of bombings that took place in, in nuclear facilities and power plants and in other in military bases. Uh, there have been cyber attacks also against Israel by the Iranians, by the way. Um, this is an ongoing battle. Right, and it and it's all aimed at how do we slow them down? Now, taking getting Fakhrizadeh out of the way is going to maybe be a uh, a bump in the road for the Iranians, but we should not live in an illusion and believe that this will stop their nuclear program. Right? I mean, they have dozens of facilities, they have dozens, if not hundreds, of technicians and scientists. They have the technical data. They're not at the stage anymore of where they're dependent on one single individual. This will harm and, and, and make it more difficult, maybe, but they can keep going, right? And, and, and the Iranian issue needs a larger resolution, whether it's a diplomatic solution of a, of a deal that will be hopefully a better deal, right, that will not be like the deal that was reached in 2015, or some sort of military operation that stops the Iranians. Uh, I pray and hope that we don't reach the stage of a military operation, because that will be extremely complicated. Uh, we will probably have losses of our own in such an operation, uh, and it could lead to a big war, right? This is what Hezbollah has been built for, let's not forget, as, as, as a sword to swing over our head and try to deter us from attacking Iran. So we have to hope that there's a diplomatic resolution, but Again, we can't count on that, and we always have to be prepared. Thank you. Michelle and Howard, do you want to follow up just on this topic? Oh. Good evening, Shavuatov. Thank you very much for a wonderful talk. Thank you. Um, we have 10 days uh, of the Trump administration left, we think we assume, and then President Biden takes over. Um, uh, the last few days obviously have been very unstable uh, and we don't know what President Trump is going to do. Uh, do you think there is uh, scope for something to happen over the next 10 days, either by the United States directly or uh, by Israel with cover, both political and military from the United States um, in terms of attacking Iran? I, I would be very surprised if in the next 10 days, Donald Trump were to decide to take military action against uh, Iran. Now, again, this president is the most unpredictable of presidents, right? Uh, but I, I can't see how 
maybe he would want this necessarily to be his legacy. I mean, maybe there's an argument to be made that he would want to distract attention away from what happened at the U.S. Capitol last week or this past week, uh, just a couple of days ago. I, I, I don't know. But again, there's no real urgency right now to do that against the Iranians. They're, they haven't, yes, they're enriching uranium to higher levels. 20% is still not military grade. It's not at a 90% level. So we're not at the stage that we have to feel that within a matter of just weeks or months, they're going to have enriched uranium to be able to build a nuclear weapon, right? They're not yet at that stage. If that were to happen, that would change everything, right? Uh, so I, I also, that's, by the way, I think the reason that Israel hasn't attacked until now is there hasn't been the feeling that we have that legitimacy yet. They're not yet building a bomb. They're creating all of the, putting all the pieces in place. But they're not yet building the bomb, and therefore Israel has also decided to hold back. If that were to happen, though, I think things would move at a much faster pace, and Israel would be pushed to take action. I don't think that Israel can live with an Iran that has a nuclear weapon, right? It would, it would not only potentially give them, you know, I wrote tomorrow's tomorrow the, tomorrow's paper's editorial about uh, what happened in the United States with Twitter and them deciding to suspend uh, Donald Trump's account. But I said, what about Khamenei's account? The, the Supreme Leader of Iran, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, openly writes on Twitter that Israel is a cancerous growth that needs to be removed, calls for jihad and attacks against Israel. That's not the glorification of violence. That is not incitement in, to violence. And I, I'm not here to defend Trump. Uh, he should be suspended too. That's fine. But you can't, you can't apply your laws this way and then that this way. This guy should also, I mean, they're the greatest state sponsor of terrorism and they're building a capability that one day would give them the ability to do what they say they openly want to do, which is to destroy the state of Israel, right? So uh, we, we can't let them have that. But they would also, uh, it would embolden their proxies, Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad, uh, the Houthis in Yemen and other places, it would give them more strength to be able to spread their hegemony throughout the region and to undermine the moderate Sunni regimes of the United Arab Emirates, of the Saudi Arabia, of Oman, of Bahrain, and other countries. Uh, and it could also set off a nuclear arms race. Other countries could say, if the Iranians have nuclear weapons, we have to get nuclear weapons. Then you'd have the Middle East, which is already such a volatile region, turn into a nuclear nightmare. Right, so this is something that Israel can just not allow, the world cannot allow to happen, definitely not Israel. I think Yitzhak, you had still a clarifying comment. No, you show me no. So I think Sarah, you had a, another question for Yaakov. Um, yeah, I read a piece that you wrote this week saying, this was, you know, after watching the terrible sort of situation, what happened at the Capitol building um, this week, that something that happened like that could also happen in Israel. Um, do you want to say something about that? Do you really think that, that, that Israelis would behave in a similar, in a similar way? You know, I hope not. <laughs> I hope not, but I, I, what I wrote is that I can't, we can't rule out this possibility. Um, unfortunately, we have the very similar ingredients to what happened in the United States here in Israel today. We have a leader who is embattled. We have a leader who is under, who's on trial, who feels that there is a, and talks openly about a so-called coup that is being attempted against him by the deep state by the justice system, by the police, the prosecution, by the media. He openly attacks all of these people, the courts. Very similar to Donald Trump. Um, he has followers who will follow him into a fire, right? Uh, and I could potentially see a scenario of where, similar to what happened on Wednesday in the, U in, in the United States, in Washington, where there was this rally and Trump goes there and says, we will never give up. Right and, and calls Pence, his vice president, and the senators and and the congressmen weak weak people, and we have they you know that they, we have to stop them and they have to decide otherwise, and then from there they breach and run towards the Capitol building and break inside. I mean, unfortunately, I see that this could happen. We 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 have we ourselves in Israel have a leader who, for the last few years, ever since his criminal investigations have begun does not hesitate to attack our democratic institutions. Now, whether he's right or wrong, 
we have to think about the state that needs to remain here afterwards, right? We have a country that has to survive us all. We have a future that we have to worry about. Now, there could be major judicial reforms that are required in Israel. I, I think that some are, as a matter of fact, the way we select our judges, some of the decisions that are taken. But you can't make those reforms while you yourself are under investigation or on trial. This is the way the system works. And when you constantly and consistently, systematically are attacking and weakening and undermining our democratic institutions, for example, the, the Israel police has not had a police chief for about two and a half years. Why? Because the prime minister doesn't want them to have a police chief. He wants to keep the police weak. The, 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 the justice ministry has not had a state attorney, the head prosecutor in this country for over a year, the same reason. Now, this is not good for Israeli democracy. And this also unfortunately could lead to something similar. I hope it doesn't. I wanna think that we are better than this. But I don't think that we can be naive. I've heard this talk before that we're better and then we slip and we, we can also find ourselves. We, we Israelis would have told you before November 1994 that we would never assassinate our leader. And then an Israeli, a Jewish Israeli took a gun on November 4th, 1994 and shot and killed uh, Yitzhak Rabin. I'm sorry, 1995. So these things can happen, right? And, and we have to be careful. And that's why we have to speak up now to make sure and be vigilant that, the, that these types of things won't happen here in Israel. Okay, um, I guess if we don't have any other questions, um, maybe we'll end off with that. Um, Yaakov, thank you so much. Um, thank you. It was really a fabulous talk. It's an honor, a privilege to have you speak to us. It's my honor to be, as Sarah told me, I'm the first speaker of, uh, of the series. So it's, it's, it's a big uh, kavod, a big honor. I really appreciate it. And I, I hope to see you all soon, either in Yerushalayim, in, in Jerusalem, or in Zurich. But hopefully we'll all be able to meet uh, healthy and, and together stay, stay yeah. safe. Yes, and you. And um, yeah, just good luck with everything, getting your second vaccine. And yeah, Thank hopefully you. in the future, when um, it's possible to again have talks in person, we will invite, be able to invite you at some stage. I look forward. I look forward. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Shavua Tov. Take care. Shavua Tov.